Right, there's, Wait, here's, an, here's to, another one. Yeah, let's maybe we do Can both. I be on your podcast? <laughs> Rich, <laughs> what? <laughs> Come on. Today, we're going to take some of life's biggest questions. We're going to toss them in a Vitamix. We're going to press hyperblend, create a metaphysical milkshake, drink it down, and nourish the soul. My brothers for this mystical journey are none other than Rain Wilson. You know this guy, star of screens big and small, best known for his portrayal of Dwight Schrute on The Office and author, producer, TV host, and scholar of religions, Reza Aslan. These two have teamed up for a podcast called, you guessed it, Metaphysical Milkshake, which you should all check out. I've wanted to meet both these guys since like forever. It finally happened. Here we are, and it is glorious. So hit that subscribe button, prepare to have your noodle bent, and enjoy my Vulcan mind meld with Reza and Rain. Um, super nice to meet you guys. I've been wanting to meet both of you for a long time. And it means a lot that you would come out here Thank and do this Rich. in person with me. Um, I love the new podcast. It's super cool. We're gonna get into all of it. We're gonna talk about the questions that really matter. Um, but first, before we do that, I, I have to say, Rain, I loved you on the Cho Show. I'm obsessed with the Cho Show. <laughs> okay. <and> all things <laughs> David Cho. I loved how you unboxed the uh, painting the other day. Yeah. And uh, I, I'm I'm trying to get David on the show. Like I just, there's something about that guy yeah. who is so magnetizing, so like his earnestness and his like childlike nature that I just feel like I, I want to have that guy. In I'm my gonna life, hook this up. You know? I'm gonna make. How did you become friends? How? Oh, uh, we Cho and I became friends through mutual, through mutual friends mm -hmm. and met. Um, and there was guy, and then this guy was hosting this kind of retreat, this like men's weekend retreat in Hawaii. And then we hung out for a whole weekend in Hawaii and went snorkeling and yeah. exploring and sharing. And you know, he kind of Cho shares everything about his right. His it's life. all on the and, sleeve. Mm -hmm. Yeah, with that guy. Um, which is so like refreshing. Yeah, you know. Yeah. Well, he used to not be. He used to be the opposite mm -hmm. of that. So mm -hmm. he used to be jaded and cynical and withholding and too cool for school and, right. and the, the crazy guy who spent months in a Japanese prison. And now he's on this journey of kind of self-discovery and it's really raw. And yeah. uh, I really appreciate what he does. And yeah. Um, yeah, he's become a good friend and and plus admire his incredible art. I mean, his artistry incredible. is astonishing. Yeah, really. I know. I hope they get a second season of that. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, similarly, I watched the uh, Bourdain doc recently, Roadrunner. Have you seen mm -hmm. it yet? Not yet, no. Um, and David plays a big part in that, especially near the end. Um, but in thinking about that documentary and, and, and um, I suspect like the influence of that, that Anthony had like on your own life and how you conceptualize believer and you know, how you um, um, kind of pursued those stories through that show. I, th I think there seems to be a lot of similarities there. Yeah, and unfortunately I never got a chance to meet um, Tony, but you know, I mean, his specter <laughs> is at every part of CNN, at least it used to be. And you know, this was a time in which I think CNN was trying to get into the entertainment business um, and they're not as much anymore, mm -hmm. I think. It's funny, cause like I, I think about you know what they were doing during that decade, and the the um, insofar as you know marketing and and the entertainment industry goes, they had this very smart plan, which was these um, Bourdain like hosts. You know, they would get somebody with strong opinions and strong views, and then they would let them pursue their expertise, their, passion. their passions, yeah. exactly. Um, but then there was this tension because they were a news outfit and a aggressively, you know, center news outfit. Mm -hmm. So there was this constant conflict between let's get people with big opinions and big personalities and let's empower them to go out there and show our viewers the world, 
but also they can't say anything Not newsworthy or yeah. political or <laughs> controversial, controversial yeah. or anything. Uh-huh. I mean, Bourdain had a lot to say, but he was smart enough to say it about British politics. <laughs> mm-hmm. <laughs> That's fine. He, he bit his tongue on American oh my politics. Gosh, right. The things this guy would say, you know, about like British politicians uh, would have definitely have gotten him fired. But I think everybody else very clearly got the message. And now- they're yeah, just not doing are, it anymore. Times are different. Yeah. Now they're well, just like, and, well no, they have, whole... they have Stanley Tucci going around Italy sampling pasta. That's what I mean. Right. So, Which, like, so it's much more milk toast. It's kind all of, milk you know. toast yeah. now. It's like the, the only, I think the only person who has survived is um, Kamal Bell. And I think partly he has, he learned very quickly mm-hmm. uh, that he should probably just keep his political opinions to himself. I mean, you know, he'll, he'll, make certain, you know, comments here and there, but nothing. Yeah. No, that kind of programming programming isn't going to exist at a place like CNN it's just anymore. Not. I mean, there's, but there are a multitude of places where you can do that kind of thing, like Netflix or maybe Vice or something like that. Used to be. Yeah. yeah. I think that's, it's kind of, that whole genre has pretty much gone by the wayside mm-hmm. nowadays. It's hard to find shows like that, like the Bourdain kind mm-hmm. of go around the world show. Again, Tucci, you know, it's like an Italian American eating pasta in Italy. It's, yeah. There's nothing controversial, controversial yeah. or, you know, on edge about it at all. Uh, Bourdain would like go to Palestine, <laughs> you know, he would right. go to Iran. Yeah. yeah. Uh, yeah. And Haiti, to, and he would talk he would about uh, income yeah, inequality. Exactly. And, you no, know, there was, ain't nobody doing that. Yeah. Anymore. He was in Beirut when all kinds of craziness broke out there. It's just funny. Cause like, it's so they they could have done, they could have just put a wall, like the way Fox News pretends to do, right? They put a wall between everything after 8 p.m. and everything before 8 p.m. or mm-hmm. 7 p.m. or whatever. Here, this is opinion. And everything right. before 7 p.m. is news. Anything that happens after 8 p.m. Like. is entertainment. <laughs> mm-hmm. It's not even opinion, right? It's just yeah. entertainment. Yeah. Um, and I think that's what CNN tried to do, but they just, they didn't go right. all in. I'm actually trying to get a show off the ground. We're actually in negotiations right now. I can't really name with who, but a, a, me going around the world, um, it's called The Geography of Bliss. And it's about what makes people happy around mm. the world. I love that. So yeah. why are people year after year happier in Finland than they are sure. in Romania? Sure. You know, and it's not just, you know, income necessarily. Mm-hmm. Um, what is it culturally or what... What habits or practices uh, make people culturally have a greater sense of well-being? Mm-hmm. So, I'm uh, sure you're familiar with Dan Buettner, then the the Blue Zones guy. Oh yeah, the Blue Zones. Yeah, yeah. Sure, you course. should have him on yeah. your show because he's all about that and like wrote a whole book about that. He has the Blue Zones of longevity, like where people live right, the longest. Yeah. But he's also done a similar study to identify the pockets around the world where people right. are the happiest. Right, right. And what makes them happy. And it's counterintuitive. It's not the things that we've so been taught think, yeah. that are, that is shoved down you know, our throats through well, marketing and media. Because I, I was reading this article about speaking of Finland and there's a, there's a Finnish word that uh, I, I don't remember, but it basically is a word that is kind of like, essentially uh, translates to keep your expectations relatively low and in check. (laughs) (laughs) So why are they happier? Because they're not expecting to live a (laughs) wildly outrageously happy life. Whereas Uh we Americans kind of feel like life, liberty, pursuit of happiness. And it's kind of like, I've got stuff. I've got, I've got cotton candy. I've got video games. I've got 147 apps on my phone. Like, why am I not happy? Mm -hmm. Like, I want to be fucking happy. Why am I not happy? And there's this kind of like, crazed outrage for happiness. Whereas this, I'm not sure that the Finnish way is the right way, by the way, mm-hmm. it's just, but it's an, it was an interesting article that had that kind of like this cultural tempered response mm-hmm. to life that, so then you're kind of like, when you are happy, you're pleasantly surprised. Like, wow, I ate some boiled yeah. fish and I was a little bit happy. <laughs> Yay me, you yeah. know? As opposed to the expectation that we're meant to be happy all the time. Yeah. Well, I would say even suffer further- disappointment. It, like baked into the concept of the American dream, right? Is this idea that you can be more, you can do more, your children will be better off yeah. than you are. Yeah. Um, anyone here can rise to the heights of wealth and power with just hard work. 
None of that is true. None of that is true anywhere in the world, right? You could work as hard as you want to. You could uh, do everything right. And it's just not guaranteed that there will be sort of uh, steady progress upward on the ladder. Mm -hmm. But imagine living and being born in a country in which that's the ethos that you should, there should there's more. Yeah, that there's, there's something else. That there's something Keep wrong going. if you haven't achieved it. Mm -hmm. So if you are not better off than your parents or not better off than your grandparents and not happy or making more money, your owning more property, it's your fault. Something has gone off the rails. Yeah, something's gone off the rails. With a light dusting of entitlement on top of it. But the only reason that this did work in the United States is because we stole a shit ton of land from the natives <laughs> yeah. and we had slave labor to build our infrastructure. So yeah. yeah, from the late 1800s to the, let's say 1970s or 1980s, there was unchecked growth because we weren't Finland. We weren't an enclosed land area just trying to subsist in that land. We were just growing and moving and having railroads and having more, you know, timber and gold and and natural resources. So we were able to kind of sustain this growth through that time period. But now, of course, here, here we are, life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. And then for the last generation or two, things have been getting worse on kind of every level. Yeah, and, and philosophically speaking, a lot of the problems that we have as a country, certainly when it comes to uh, the sort of giant chasm in social incomes, uh, you know, and and um, you know the the kind of huge gap between the poor and the wealthy, the way that we treat wealthy people, the way that we think about religion and spirituality in the United States, it's all a byproduct of this American mm. dream ethos, right? We look at rich people and assume that they are rich because they deserved to be rich, mm -hmm. right? We had this conversation a lot when Trump was running for office, right? It's like, I'm rich, so therefore um, I know what I am doing. We actually did a, a podcast episode on this, this idea that wealth not, doesn't just equal um, success, it equals morality. Like we, we look at rich people as being more moral. Um, look at the prosperity gospel, a thing that could really only exist in the United yeah, States, right? Yeah. Uh, the whole concept of which is wealth is indicative of your salvation. If you are rich, it's because God has rewarded you. It's a, it's a symbol of the fact that you are saved. And so mm -hmm. you should pursue wealth the way that you would pursue you know, spiritual edification. I mean, name another country in which that is a prevailing view of, you know, tens of millions of the citizenship. It's just it's crazy. Yeah, I think on top of that also, just the mere statement, the pursuit of happiness is wrongheaded in the sense that happiness is a byproduct of, of other pursuits, such as, you know, trying to find purpose in your life. Like you mentioned sure. the Finnish word mm -hmm. in Okinawa, they have a word ikigai, like, which is essentially means to live a life that is purposeful, to wake up in the morning and feel a sense of purpose and obligation and happiness being a byproduct of orienting, orienting your life around that type of ethos rather so than true. you know the pursuit of accumulation that has yeah. led to you know and this is what I want to get into like this crisis of of consciousness that we find ourselves in certainly you know religion is a is a predominant aspect of of living in america but on a spiritual level i feel like we're we're bereft of 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 the meaning that is behind the pursuit of a spiritual life, and that's led to so much of our our, our fractured society and our inability to communicate with each other and the pr the way in which we prioritize our lives. We're all about I that. Know. Yeah, man. I know. Oh, that's man. that's. I know. This is like your jam. <laughs> that's, this is, and this is why this is, this is a big reason why I wanted to have you guys here. Like I'm looking at. <laughs> You know the people that you've selected to have on your show. There's a there's an overlap with some of my guests, and then you have some upcoming guests, uh, people that I've had on my show. Yeah. Um, and you know the 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 we big basically looked through your life. guest lists, and we've, uh, <laughs> yeah. we're, we're going to get the open. Rabbi Mordecai. Not that either of you would ever have a problem <laughs> getting you know finding any of these people, but whoever you want, yeah, you got to have Rabbi Mordecai. Yeah, he's amazing. Uh, he's the best. Wow. Man. Wow. Um, but I'm interested in how all of this came about. I mean, essentially a Baha'i actor and a Sufi Muslim, uh, you know, walk walk into a bar or a soundstage and say, hey, you've 
dominated screens, big and small. So have I, like, what are we gonna do next? Well, I guess we'll do a podcast, So right? I actually so, think it was on a <laughs> stage, not a bar. It, it was a stage a and it was, um, we, we met on a stage at USC and um, we were doing, uh, I was emceeing an event about the, the treatment of members of the Baha'i faith in its home country of Iran and how they're being terribly persecuted mm -hmm. there by the kind of Muslim theocracy. That's and, an understatement. Um, and Reza <laughs> was a, a speaker and featured speaker there. And we met, that was the first time we met. And then we met at a fellow Baha'i's house who uh, was a, mm -hmm. a producer and funder of media. And Reza had just started his kind of production company working in media um, and Aslan Media? No, what's it? No, it was uh, Boom Gen. Boom is, Generation. The, yeah, yeah, Boom Gen mm -hmm. uh, Studios, and and then he wrote his book about Jesus. He wrote this little book about Jesus. Yeah. Became a number one bestseller <laughs> yeah, yeah. for like eight months in a row, and kind of redefined how so many people kind of look at the Bible. And we did an event where I, you know, got to do a Q and A with him about his book. I was a huge fan. Thank you for of, that, by the way. Of Zealot, really nice yeah, we're in that little mm -hmm. church. Yeah, yeah. and um, eight years ago. And uh, yeah, and then, you know, bumped into each other through, and then we're having breakfast one day and I was talking about my spiritual journey in life and what I'm dealing with. And Reza's talking about his spiritual journey in life and what he's dealing with and his challenges. And, you know, I found our conversations just kind of bouncing around, kind of like the way they are this morning. And we're like, this should be a podcast. We really yeah. <laughs> should have a microphone between yes. us and be having this conversation, you know, with, with a listening audience. And at the time, um, this company that I had founded, Soul Pancake, a, a digital media company that probes life's biggest questions and is all about uplifting, you know, challenging content. They produced it, and we did season one on Luminary. Now that's season two uh, out in the general podcast sphere, and that's kind of how it started. But it was essentially a shared love of exactly what you were talking about. Mm. That um, there are these huge questions about life that um, have been relegated to kind of philosophical academics that you take in undergrad philosophy 101 mm -hmm. and that people kind of oftentimes uh, steer away from. Mm -hmm. um, I have some stuff to say about that uh, later on, uh, specifically with a recent death of a friend of mine. And um, uh, so we just felt like there's all these spiritual tools and spiritual perspectives about looking at all of these questions. Not that every episode that we do is spiritual. Some episodes we were just talking about politics and sociology mm -hmm. or just feelings, but underneath there's underpinnings mm -hmm. of um, a spiritual connection, which has to do with reason and purpose. Why are we here? And how does yeah. that guide our approach to asking these deep probing questions. And, and, and it's not about the answers so much as it is the practice of wrestling with the questions yeah. and the practical tools that we can extract from, from them because philosophy and spirituality should be uh, a, a roadmap for how we live. It, yeah. it shouldn't just live in the halls of academia or in conversations behind closed doors. Like there's great practical wisdom packed into all of this, of course. and. And I think, you know, we're in a culture that's in desperate need of that kind of mainline injection into how we think. And, Absolutely. You know, prioritize our, our, our lives. Yeah, Sufism has this concept that it's all about the path and not the destination. You know, I mean, the important thing is to be moving forward stage after stage, evolving at every step, getting closer and closer, but recognizing that you'll probably never get to the destination and that's mm -hmm. okay. And it's the same kind of philosophy that we bring to a lot of these existential questions, which is, you said it right. The question sometimes is more important than the answer. Now, mm -hmm. occasionally we'll come up with some pretty good answers, <laughs> right? Well, yeah, we've, you know, we've hit a few we've jackpots. A, yeah, we've hit a few jackpots and, surpri and surprising too, you know, and and also answers. In fact, let me, let me just jump in there. Go ahead, yeah. And Reza, this uh, podcast that was two ago, Mike Shore. I was just gonna say that, Because I, yeah. I wanna tee you up because you had, it was really fun having a conversation with Mike Shore, who's, he was, a writer, director on The Office. He's the creator of Parks and Rec mm -hmm. and also The Good Place. And we were talking about the, the show, The Good Place and about being good. And that was our life's big question in the episode. Like, how do we be good? How do right. we know what that means to be good? And over the course of this 
conversation, like I saw this like giant, like it was a cartoon, a giant light bulb <laughs> over Reza's head True. as he kind of like some some things clicked in. You want to do want to? Well, so a lot of the questions that sorry that we, we have we hijacked your podcast. This is great, <laughs> man. It just okay. make it's I can relax. <laughs> can we ask you guys you are pros? This is a, <laughs> no, go have for a it. vegan donut or something, whatever you eat. <laughs> a lot of a lot of the episodes that we that we do are based on just questions that Rain and I have, mm-hmm. <laughs> you know, and one of at least my biggest questions has been for a very very long time: How can you be good? Like, how can you just be a good person? Um, Divorce from, you know, religious obligations and dogma and all of that yeah. stuff. And, you know, I went into this conversation, as I often do, assuming there's no real answer to this, but let's have fun with the question. And Mike, I think, summed it up so well. He said, the way that you can be good is to try. And it was... Those simple little things that sometimes happen in the podcast, right? Mm. Uh, the same thing happened when we when we talked to the great Krista Tippett about wisdom. Like, what is wisdom? Well, all right, I've got a couple of answers for that, but none of them are, you know, that. How can you be wise? I don't know. I, I've got. I, I can wax philosophical about that, but again, she she kind of encapsulated it so perfectly. She said, um, "Wisdom is found." in the impact that you leave on the people around you. And I thought, well, that's an answer. Mm. I mean, that's- <laughs> Yeah, I've never heard that's it. That's not Put just that an way. idea, that's just an answer. And I I mean, sometimes there are answers and sometimes those answers hit me like a ton of bricks. Those two yeah. have stayed with me for a very, very yeah, yeah, long yeah. time. That's cool. Um, but we always go into these episodes recognizing that, you know, at the end of this 45, 50 minute conversation, maybe all that we've done is really ask the question in a proper way and gave it the weight that it deserves. And the weight that so often we don't give anymore. (laughs) Rain said it perfectly. Like these are the kinds of questions that you used to ask in college. All right, it's been a long time since I've been in college. It's been a very long time since I think anyone at this table has been in college. And now we have kids and we have jobs and we have mortgages and we have bills to pay. And I don't, ask those questions anymore. They mm-hmm. still rattle around in the back of my brain, but they're rarely actually things I get to think about. Mm-hmm. And that's what we get to do with Metaphysical Milkshake is think about them and hell, we get paid to do it. Yeah, a little bit. <laughs> I a mean, little. a little bit, but still. It's not very much. No, not, not that Compared to an episode not, of Network <laughs> TV no. in its no. ninth yeah, season. I think nah. you need to recalibrate your barometer. <laughs> <laughs> a little bit of rain. Well, Reza, um, he's an academic and an yes, author. Yes, I don't understand. You know, he's, a, he's a professor at the UC system. So I he's know. not, you mm-hmm. know. Um, are you still teaching now? You teach creative writing, yeah. I do, I yeah. do. I am a, I'm a professor of creative writing at, at UC Riverside. Uh-huh. I've been there since, I guess, 2007. We'll be back in a sec, but first, if you dig this podcast, and I hope you dig this podcast, then I think you'll really enjoy my latest book, Voicing Change, featuring excerpts from poignant essays by and glorious photography of some 50 of my favorite guests over the last eight plus years of doing this thing, this podcast. It's a gorgeous, artful compendium of the show and copious wisdom shared therein, all wrapped in a hardcover coffee table form that provides a great taste of what we do here at the RRP and serves as a beautiful keepsake or gift for the ardent fan. The book is only and exclusively available on our website, signed copies are available and we are shipping globally direct to any coffee table on planet earth. So to learn more and snag your copy today, visit richroll.com slash VC. That's richroll.com slash VC. All right, let's get back into it. Well, I thought what would be fun since this is all about uh, questions, big and small, is to do something a little bit different. This is an idea that I got from uh, Rob Bell, you guys know where you sure. are. Sure, we Bell, love right? Rob Bell. Yeah, Rob Bell. I'm certain has gone on your show. He's right? been on. He's he did it. Been he did on? it. Two okay, parter. Cool. Yeah, I was going to say the yeah. only two parter. Ever. Uh-huh. Good. You of course. Get, you, you, no, you can't like, get him to be quiet. No, no, no. Yeah, <laughs> just you don't want him to be quiet. <laughs> you don't want yeah. him to be quiet. Yeah. Um, but I went to. He did a live podcast at Largo um, with Liz Gilbert, and they did kind of a choose your adventure thing um, with a what we have here in front of us, which is essentially a fishbowl with a bunch of wadded up pieces of paper. On each piece of paper here, I put one of these 
big questions. So I thought we could just pick one out. This could go terribly wrong, by the way. This could be, yeah. this could be, this could be awful. A disaster. Disaster. This could but be, uh, let's do it. Let's the pretend. The dorm room conversation. Let's pretend should, we're I, should I start us? Yeah. Should First I launch us? away from our parents. And if it's, if we've already talked about it or it's bad, we could just go back to the well. What do you got there? There's does, some stupid ones in there too. Does everybody have a purpose? That's a good one. I think that's a great one. Yeah. yeah let's, 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 let's do that one. Let's yeah. do that one. Um, I believe that everyone has a purpose. I believe this with all of my heart and uh, in a very strong way. Because as a member of the Baha'i faith, but not just a Baha'i faith, I think anyone who has, I mean, I think that's an answer that applies to both theists and atheists. But uh, as a member of the Baha'i faith, I believe that um, we're on an eternal spiritual journey, that this you know, our, whatever, our soul, our eternal part of ourselves is encased in this flesh tuxedo for 80 or 90 years. We slough it off and we continue our journey mm. beyond time and space. So while we're here, everyone has a purpose. Now, it, it may not be like everyone on planet Earth has a purpose like Oprah has a purpose. I mean, it's it's about <laughs> we can't finding. All be Oprah. Yeah. <laughs> you can't, we can't have seven billion Oprahs on the planet. But I do think that... Um, this is one of the really exciting tasks. Um, is there's a there's a there's a there's a question wrapped there's a riddle in, wrapped inside this question, which is our purpose is to find our purpose. Mm -hmm. And as soon as we found our purpose, we have to be not sure that that's our purpose, and we have to keep finding our purpose. So by the time we're ninety seven and we keel over, hopefully we're all continuously on this. Um, at the very beginning footsteps of this eternal journey toward finding what what that purpose is. And it mm -hmm. may shift and change. And so whether you call that, you know, God or or the, or the great spirit or the, just the power of the universe or the winds of the cosmos or the mystic connection or whatever you want to call God, which has become a four-letter word and is a, is a tough concept to dig into, but the winds, the Holy Spirit, the, the winds of the cosmic power of the creative force that surrounds us, that's within us, without us, beyond us, beyond limitations of time and space. This has a, these winds have a very special, um, uh, we have a very special relationship with them, mm -hmm. I believe. And it's for, it's like, a, it's, it's like when you go sailing, I don't know anything about sailing. I've, barely, I've been sailing like twice, but the whole idea that you you tack your sails to try and, get the most out of the wind, depending on, you have a vague, you know, I want to go toward that island, but you may not go directly to the island. You may, the, the winds may take you off to the left a little bit and then back, or you may have to zigzag. The winds stall for a little bit. You turn on your motor, then the winds are pushing you right there, but you you are trying to align yourself with those with those winds. And it's, it's really, it's exciting. Mm -hmm. I think it's a really exciting part of being alive, maybe the most exciting, exciting part of being alive. And, and this is where I think, that young people, especially, I don't know about older people. I mean, older people, we, we get set in our ways. And like Reza said, we've got kids and jobs and mortgages and kind of, you know, we have a little bit of stuff figured out, but especially for this mental health crisis that is afflicting uh, kids under under 20 or 30, it, it's it's astonishingly uh, insidious and toxic and, and fatal. And, but, but this, this connection to this question, um, is a big part of helping to use a spiritual tool to solve that mm -hmm. issue, to solve yeah. that problem. Beautifully put. Hard agree. Thanks. Yeah. Can we just end the podcast? Hard <laughs> yeah, agree. Yeah, boom. The only thing that I'll just say to to people who are listening to this, because I I, I mean, I could have listened to that all day. It's 100% oh, thanks, true. I, uh, I agree with it 100%. And I have like philosophical and theological reasons why I agree with it and experiential reasons why I agree with it. But what I'll just say is that if you are listening to this and saying, okay, fine, everybody has a purpose. Well then, you know, how do I, am I doing my purpose? How do I know what my purpose is? Um, if you're, if you don't know, then you're not doing it. it it's for those people, like I feel like I am achieving my purpose. Uh, I would say probably you too, mm -hmm. Rich. Yeah, Rain. I mean, you're doing what your purpose is. I wrestle with it, truth be told. But yes, by and large, I do. You know, just, well, I mean, you're, the it's a constant, for me, a constant 
a series of the use going back to the sailboat metaphor. That's it's like adjusting those sails. Yeah. But yeah. The, it, that metaphor is so perfect because everyone, everyone who has had this experience will tell you that when the wind is right and your sail is, you know, exactly where it's supposed to be and you're moving smoothly. And I mean this metaphorically, not actually on the water, but I mean in life, you know it, yeah. mm-hmm. you know it. Mm-hmm. And you always know when you're fighting the wind. Um, so pay attention to that feeling. Yeah. Pay attention to that. If you're sitting there thinking to yourself, well, then how do I know what my purpose is? Are you fighting the wind? Hmm. Is that what it feels like? Then you're not pursuing your purpose. And here's yeah. another thing I'll say. You ready for this? I'm ready. Okay. Fasten. The bar is high now. Okay. <laughs> Fasten your podcast seatbelts, Rich. Um, if, if people are listening to this and saying, well, I just don't know, or I can't find mine. And I've tried to be a massage therapist. And then I had a job as this, and I tried to start up a, a business here. And I went back to school for this and I, it's not working out and blah, blah, blah. Well, I will say, and this is going to sound crazy. It's going to sound crazy. Pray. Hmm. Pray. That doesn't mean you have to go into a Catholic church and cross yourself and look at an icon to pray. It doesn't mean that there's an old white man with a beard on a cloud granting wishes like Santa Claus from up above. Um, but we live in a society in LA, at least, and I, I find this really interesting that everyone in LA, not everyone, a lot of people in LA meditate, but don't pray because, oh, I have such a hard time with a higher power. And everyone in mid America prays and doesn't meditate. Right. <laughs> so they don't yeah. kind of deeply contemplate uh-huh. or they're not open to a kind of the receiving the wisdom from the universe, from the act of prayer. Mm-hmm. But people in LA are just receiving and never asking because another reason why, because it takes humility to pray. Mm. And people in LA on the coast don't have a lot of humility. Right. It's in short <laughs> supply. When you pray, and again, I'm just talking about opening your heart to the spirit of the cosmic creative force of the universe. I'm not talking about like, crossing yourself oh God, and, you know, please kind of dog, give me a pony. You know, it's, it's just saying, universe, where would you have me go? All mm-hmm. loving providence that surrounds me, what would you have me do and how would you have me do it? Um, I'm open to signs. Mm-hmm. Just be like, I'm open. Yeah. You can just wake up and you just say, I'm open and that's a prayer. Yeah, there's an expansiveness to like broadening your perception and your your willingness to just be in that receiving mode and in the asking mode. But I think we all to some extent have this yearning inside of us for some, they're very conscious of it. For others, perhaps it's a little bit more muted, but this sense of there is something for me out there. And I do think there's beauty in pursuing that. but. I think you're right, Reza, like most people don't know what their purpose is. Perhaps they don't spend enough time or very much time at all thinking about it, but I do believe that it is out there for everybody. And I think that part of the beauty of life is the pursuit of finding that. And I would tweak a little bit, Rain, what you said, this idea that once you find it, then you continue to find it, like you iterate on it or you remain open to it changing or morphing in certain ways. But I think an important piece also to that is than sharing what you learned in service to other people, mm, like yeah. the service piece yeah. of it, yes. I think really um, strengthens that sense of purpose. Um, and, and the search for it is, you know, yes, prayer, meditation and all of that, but ultimately it is an inside job. Like you have to become um, integrated with who you are. You have to get to know yourself, like know thyself, because otherwise you're not gonna hear that vibration. and your boat is gonna be you know, tacking against the wind. And it's only when you know yourself well enough that you can determine, okay, I have to of course correct. And here's how I get more in alignment with like my energy and paying attention to the way the universe responds to that. So you can you know, make those fine tuned adjustments that, that lead you in that direction that you seek. Mm-hmm. I mean, I'll use myself as an example, <clears throat> classic LA narcissist. Um, <laughs> A praying narcissist. <laughs> <laughs> he prays to himself. Yes. <laughs> you should have mentioned that part. <laughs> to my bobblehead. <laughs> yeah. The um for most of my life, my purpose was to be an actor. That's all I wanted to do. I just wanted to learn how to act. I wanted to be a better and better actor. 
I wanted to learn skills of acting. Then I wanted to learn how to act in front of a camera and I wanted to do comedy and drama and play different kinds of roles and play serial killers and, and weirdos and slapstick and you name it. And my whole life from when I was a teenager and I first started acting at like 16, um, all the way up into my, well into my 40s and late 40s, I lived, slept and breathed acting. And I saw myself as actor as storyteller. I didn't just say like, oh, I just want a job so I can buy a house, although that was nice. But, you know, it, as an actor in the greatest sense, you're part of telling a story and mm -hmm. entertaining and there is a service component to it. Um, and then it's been very interesting for me because over the last six, eight years or so, it's like it's held much less kind of, of a draw. You mm -hmm. know, I still like doing it sometimes, but... Um, it, I don't, my life isn't based around that next acting yeah. job. So it has been like, is this a change in purpose, a shift in purpose mm. in my life? So starting Soul Pancake, writing more stuff, writing books, working with Reza like on this pod and doing more service work, nonprofit work that I do with my wife in Haiti, et cetera. Like finding more meaning from that stuff. And because purposes can change. Yeah, that's interesting. I mean, you're you're a you're a G in the whole digital content space. I mean, Soul Pancake oh, yeah. was 2009. When did you start that? Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. I mean, pretty early in the whole like high vibe, sharing cool yeah. content. Like taking we, we were the first taking we, we literally wisdom were the first, and making yeah. it cool for young people. Yeah. Creating mm -hmm. digestible content. Yeah, 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 you know. yeah. Yeah, it was. Um, it was an amazing adventure to start that with some friends and to just be ideating on like, speaking of that service component, yeah. like what can we do for young people on the internet that's cool and right. fun and that can be a business, that can be a sustainable yeah. business model as and well. Wasn't, wasn't uh, Metaphysical Milkshake like in the back of a van or something? Or was that, yeah. did it have a different name then? Or you were kind of doing this. drive around in a van and yeah. ask people to <laughs> yeah. get in and I talk about- take, uh, People existential issue, <laughs> right? <laughs> um, Steve-O's doing that now. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> the, um, I guess, uh, yeah, it was, Metaphysical Milkshake was the original name of Soul Pancake. Mm, the oh, wow. very first oh. name, but we quickly scrapped that because it was so weird. And um, <laughs> it became, yeah, it was a talk show in the back of my van. And But it was about life's big questions, but I would ha interview actors and celebrities yeah. and, and stuff like that. So we just kind of held on to the name. I, I love the name and, and moved it into the podcast right. space. Reza, you were about I just, to say something. Just to put a, a, you know, a close to the conversation about purpose. Um, yeah, I really like what Rain was saying. My wife and I have a couple of sort of life mottos, family mottos that, that we um, you know, focus on a lot. And one of them is have a mission, not a job. And I, I say this to my students all the time because I think so much so many of us pursue jobs. I want to be an actor. That's what my passion is. I want to be a writer. That's where my passion is. That's great. But what's your mission? Mm. You know, your your mission is bigger than the things the things that you do, right? If you have a mission, then you can have multiple ways in which that mission expresses itself, like acting or, you know, writing or service or whatever the, the thing is. So, you know, if you're sitting there and you're thinking to yourself, what do I wanna do with my life? Tweak that question just a little bit. What is your mission in life? Pursue that mission. And I promise you, doors people, will open. People mm -hmm. will pay you for it, <laughs> you know? Mm. But it's the rare individual who, who has a grip on that, right? I feel like, mm -hmm. especially with young people, like you have to live some life. Like you have to travel, you have to collect experiences. You have to put yourself out there. How yeah. could you possibly, Absolutely. you know, it's not gonna, it's not a thunderbolt thing. I mean, there's always the kid who, you know, at age six knows what he or she wants to do, but that's <laughs> that really the outlier. Well, this is, yeah. this is what I always say to when I, because I do some speaking at college campuses and stuff too. And I just tell people like, 20s are a waste of time. Like, don't even worry about it. Don't try and get yeah. it figured out. Like you're, the point of your 20s is to try 12 different mm -hmm. things and fail at nine of them mm -hmm. um, so that you can come out. But there's all the societal pressure of like, that's not urination, by the way. If you're hearing that <laughs> in a microphone, that's Reza pouring a glass yeah. of water. There's no proof of that. Um, but, but 
truthfully, in society right now, you talk to so many college kids and they're so depressed at 2021 because they don't, they haven't gotten the perfect internship over the summer and they're not mm-hmm. pre-enrolled in the perfect grad program mm-hmm. and they don't have their, um, you know, their their job aligned. Now I know it's hard to make a living out there. You know, it's hard to have a career and make a living. It's much harder than in the 80s and 90s when we were, you know, getting our educations. But nonetheless, if you view the 20s as a workshop stage, then it gives yeah. you some, so you can relax a little bit. That's but you got to do right. some counter-programming around that. You're asking young people to step off the hamster wheel. And that's pretty scary, especially for a kid who's, you know, kind of been on that track where it's like, get into the right college, get the mm-hmm. right job. And mm-hmm. then, oh, if I, if I opt out of that, then life's going to pass me by. But obviously, you know, it's quite the contrary. Yeah. And I think too, for mission, and we've been on this topic too long, but- Yeah, we're gonna have to pick another the, uh, <laughs> thing. Uh, I think, here you go, Reza. I just think in terms of mission too, it doesn't have to be grand. You know, like we don't all have to change the world. Your mission can be, yeah. I wanna build beautiful things out of wood. Yeah. And I wanna exactly. have a be- nice family. That's exactly what I mean. Yeah, I, I, that's it, what I mean. I don't mean like, yes, uh, maybe the, your mission is change the world. Great. Yeah. Okay. Well done, Greta. Um, but like, yeah, my mission- from a very early age was to change the way that people think through stories. I didn't say to myself, I'm going to be a writer. I'm going to be a television producer. You know, I'm going to be like a podcast host. But all of those are just different Mm. ways of telling stories to change the way that people think. So Mm. those are the jobs that I do, but the mission is something else. Mm. That's great. All right, right, my turn, cool. my turn, my turn. Here we go, here we go. All right. What do we got here? Okay. Um, oh, <laughs> hey, hey, this is right up my alley. What do people misunderstand about spirituality? Ooh, that's a good, oh, good one. one. This is it. Yeah. We're not going to get past this question, no. are we? We could spend <laughs> the next it. four hours this talking is, about this. This is it right here. All right. All right, Rain and I have a lot to say about this. Let me start. Um, first of all, that religion and faith are two different things, right? They're not the same thing. I think in a lot of thinking, people just assume that um, that they're the same. In fact, they'll say the, the way that they talk, right? They'll say things like, I believe in Christianity or I believe in the Bible, mm-hmm. you know? And I'm like, you believe it exists? I don't understand what you mean by that because these are not ends in them themselves. They're paths to an end. Religion, spirituality, whatever that means, faith, whatever that means, it's it's individualistic, it's nebulous, it's ineffable, it's undefinable, it's mysterious. It's about, it's experiential more than anything mm. else. It's yeah. about how you see yourself and your your place in the in the universe. Mm-hmm. Um, religion is the language that you use to express that feeling, right? We have we have ways of talking about so many of our emotions. We have an entire language dedicated to expressing love. We have an entire language dedicated to expressing anger. What is the language to express this mysterious, ineffable part of human nature? Well, it's religion and that's all it is. And the problem that I think so so many people get into is that they forget that their religion, whatever their religion is, is a means to an end. They confuse it for the end in and of itself. Mm-hmm. And so I think that's the biggest, that to me, that's the biggest problem. So when people, you know, talk about spirituality, especially people who claim that to not be spiritual, What they really mean is I'm not religious. That's what they really mean. When you start to poke at them and ask and and probe and try to figure out what do they mean when they say, I don't believe in God or or, I don't, you know, I don't I don't accept religion, what are they actually talking about? You start to recognize that, yeah, they're not talking about spirituality. They're not talking about faith. They're talking about rules and rituals and and you know belief mm-hmm. systems and dogmas and you know mm-hmm. do's mm-hmm. and don'ts and institutions and authority structures what does any of that have to do with mm-hmm. faith and mm-hmm. with spirituality mm-hmm. so uh, that's that's i would say the first thing the first thing yeah. is 
recognizing the difference between those two things. Well said, and I agree 100%. And uh, so many people can't um, differentiate the two. I remember I was doing this movie with this director and he's like, oh, so you're all into spirituality and God and stuff. And we were kind of touring this old church at the time. I was like, yeah, I believe in God and I love reading about it and studying about it and talking about it and stuff. He's like, oh, I don't believe in God. Mm -hmm. And I was like, oh, really, you don't? He's like, oh no, my parents dragged me to church every day, not even once a week. I had to go every day and sit for mass and I had to do this and they made me a choir boy. I'm like, oh, I don't believe in God. So it had been completely fused with his right. traumatic childhood experience. The fact that, you know, is there a creative force in the universe that, that transcends the material has been kind of locked in, mm -hmm. uh, you know, zipped in with that with that childhood experience. But mm -hmm. I think that um, two things come to mind for me. What what do people misunderstand about mm -hmm. spirituality? One is that um, you know, in the Hindu concept of Maya or, or illusion, it's that not only is it that the material world is an illusory world. It's not even that so much. People kind of misunderstand it that from my limited understanding and reading about it. But this concept of Maya is that there is, there is a, a we are fooled into thinking that there is duality. Mm -hmm. So it's not that we're, that we're fooled by the material. Well, we're fooled into thinking that there is duality. So I would say that this constant battle of like religion versus science or spirituality versus science, that they're the same thing. Mm -hmm. there, are, there is one reality, there's two ways of kind of measuring, quantifying, looking at, interacting with this reality. Mm -hmm. science, science is the, you know, an incredible way of repeating experiments and understanding the material world. And spirituality is, uh, again, it's the science of understanding the other aspects mm -hmm. of being alive, about, about love and service and, and kindness and, and our journeys and mission and, and that they both are harmonious. There is not a false duality. There's not a Maya. There's not an illusion of this versus that. We're very yeah. mind, body, spirit. Yeah. I was just gonna say that the way that I refer to it, there are two modes of knowing. Hmm. There are two modes of knowing. That's that's what they are. Yeah. Mm. Yeah, that's that's perfectly said. I think the other thing that people misunderstand about spirituality is I really like nuts and bolts practical spirituality. Like I I don't think the spirituality has to be like really airy fairy. It doesn't have to be really like this kind of nebulous feeling of connectivity, although that's nice. There's nothing wrong with that. There are spiritual tools that can make our lives better, that can actually make us happier right. and more fulfilled. So there are, and those are found in all the faith traditions. Mm -hmm. They're found in Christianity, Judaism, Buddhism, certainly. And that's a cornerstone of Baha'i, this idea that that there's a universality in all these strains of, yeah. of faith. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so the Baha'is believe that all of the world's religions come from the same source. Mm -hmm. And this God has chosen to educate humanity by sending down these divine teachers throughout time. We know many of them, Zoroaster, Abraham, to go way back, Krishna, but the Buddha, Jesus, yeah. Muhammad, and now Baha'u'llah is the most recent of these uh, divine teachers and they all, it's like they're teachers in a school. Like the school has a purpose, which is to educate its students, but you have to go through kindergarten and then first grade and third grade. The teachers all know the same amount. They're all just as, mm -hmm. uh, uh, what, uh, professional. They're just as wise. They have mm -hmm. the same amount of knowing, but they're just slowly unfolding this kind of spiritual maturation of the human species so that these spiritual tools can be found throughout history and they are there to make our lives better, both personally and also societally. Yeah. I was just gonna just add one more thing to this uh, and excuse me, to, I'm just gonna get a little academic here because I think it's important. Um, what we call religion, we could probably trace, um, you know, maybe six, seven, eight, 9,000 years. What we, what we refer to as institutionalized religion. What I mean by that is it's a cohesive system of beliefs and practices. It's a top-down uh, you know, system. It's institutionalized. There's a you know, priesthood or whatever the case may be. Books with like rules yeah, and Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, the, even before there was, there was any writing. So you know, writing was invented maybe 3000 BC. 
and what we call religion. I'll even, we can go maybe to like 10,000, 12,000 BC. So that's the, the oldest temple that we have is, a, is around okay. that period between 12 and 10,000 BC, the oldest temple that we have found. What we call spirituality, and I think Rain hit it on the head when he said what, what we mean by spirituality, which is recognition and communion with the thing that is beyond the material realm. Mm, well so said. this sort of, mm -hmm. this urge for transcendence, that which is beyond. We have hard archeological evidence for the belief in the non-material world that goes back 200, 300,000 years. We have material evidence of that belief mm -hmm. in, the, in Neanderthals. Not even the human species. Not, not even in Homo sapiens, exactly. Like we, we, we can trace that belief to 100,000 years before there was such a thing as Homo sapiens. And then I would say even further, there's, there's some material evidence that's a little bit more debatable that goes back all the way to Cro-Magnum. Over the last 30, 40 years or so, there's been this kind of new science in, in the study of religion, and it's called the cognitive theory of religion. Well, a lot of these you know, great cognitive theorists, these people who study the way that the brain works, mm -hmm. have started to ask themselves, why is spirituality or the religious impulse, as I like to call it, why is that a universal phenomenon? Why is it something that exists in every culture in every people, in every part of the world for all of time. Why is it something that predates our species? Why? Because if it predates our species, if it's universal, then it, there must be some evolutionary reason for it, right? Mm -hmm. There's gotta be mm -hmm. some kind of adaptive advantage to it. Um, long story short, there is no adaptive advantage to it. We've asked every question that we could possibly ask. Well, maybe it's about, you know, morality. No, that's not it. Maybe it's about answering questions. That's not it. You, maybe it's about social cohesion. Nope, that's not it. We've we've answered all of those questions. And the fact of the matter is that we don't know. We have no idea mm -hmm. why what we call spirituality is a universal phenomenon, part of our evolution as a species. What is the purpose of it? Mm -hmm. We don't know. The, the best answer that uh, the cognitive scientists that I um, sort of uh, look to, the best answer that they've given is that it's an accident. It's just a, like a, a byproduct of some other, you know, adaptive advantage that was necessary very early in our evolution, something that helped us survive. And as a accidental echo of that thing came the universal conception of spirituality. Yeah. That's a good answer. It's super interesting. I, I would suspect that part of, would it, would, it, would it not be considered an evolutionary advantage to like part of this being this quest to understand things that we don't understand, right? So, we we yeah. look up to the stars, we don't have the scientific tools or the acumen to really understand what that is. We create myths, we create yeah. stories around that that help us, you know, feel better about who we are or feel like our lives have some level of meaning. And in modern times, you know, God is dead, spirituality, religion has been supplanted by science, science has become our God. Science is what we look to for all of these answers. Mm -hmm. And there's a hubris within the human being that science will ultimately, if we keep doubling down on it, provide everything that we need, which now you know makes spirituality and religion an antiquated idea right. altogether. Yeah, so that and was yet actually- it prevails. That was one of the first theories about why, why the universal phenomenon of the religious impulse. The problem with that theory is that there's literally no adaptive advantage whatsoever to having airy fairy answers to the questions of the universe. Quite the contrary. In fact, what those answers do 
Why, why does the sun shine? Because there's a sun God, et cetera, what, all that. What those answers end up doing is forcing individuals to exert resources and energy that should be spent on survival. So it's actually the opposite of an right, adaptive because, advantage. Because if you're burying your Viking king and you put your swords and jewelry in the tomb because he's gonna need <laughs> them to go on a on his yeah. quest into yeah. Valhalla, then you've done a great disservice <laughs> to your community. Disadvantage yeah. to your community, <laughs> absolutely. I mean, we don't, we don't need to get too deeply involved in this, but I mean, I'm sure a lot of people out there are like, well, what about this and what about that? What about social cohesion? Doesn't, re doesn't religious belief or spirituality help a, a community become tighter. And so if a community is tighter, they have a better chance of survival. True, except that that's not how Neanderthals or Homo sapiens created community. Community was kinship. It wasn't, you didn't create your community because you all believed the same thing. You created your community because you shared the same blood. Honestly, that didn't really happen until Christianity. <laughs> you know? Right, well, and your survival depended exactly. upon it. But here's, here's, the, here's the bottom line of what I'm trying to say here is that we don't know, maybe we'll find out one day, but we don't know why religion, or I'm sorry, why the religious impulse, the desire for transcendence, the belief that there is something else beside the material realm, why is that universal? Why is it part of our evolutionary process? We don't know. But embedded in the question to me is the answer. Mm -hmm. Embedded in the question is the fact that whatever spirituality is, okay, back to this, to the question, what do we misunderstand about spirituality? Whatever it is, it is the normal functioning of your brain. <laughs> That's what it is. Yeah. Your brain well said. is mm. designed to think mm -hmm. that there is a reality beyond the material realm. And we've been thinking this way for 100, 200,000 years. Yes, yeah. mm -hmm. so you can deny that if you want to. You can say, no, there isn't anything beyond the material realm, fine. But that's a conscious decision. Your brain is designed to think that there is. And maybe we should take that seriously for a minute. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we can, uh, we can talk about why, we don't know. But the fact that it does, the fact that your brain is meant to think this way mm. should make us stop and think, well, maybe there's something to it. Yeah. It's fantastic. I thought you said you were tired today. Yeah, I know. I thought you said you were out of it. <laughs> Qualified it by saying- Somebody brought up spirituality. Okay. <laughs> All right, okay, Rich, I do, before you do that though, I wanted to um, follow up on one point that you made, Rain, about uh, you know dualistic thinking. Reza, you said, you know, many people will say, um, I'm not spiritual because they're affiliating that with, with religion. Um, I think in Los Angeles, it's the inverse. Like people will say they're spiritual, but they're not religious. Yeah. But on that idea of, of binary thinking that um, science is at the exclusion of spirituality. I mean, for me, the more you delve into spirituality, the more amazing everything becomes. And the deeper you dive into science, the more mystical it becomes. Mm. Like I don't see those as being mutually exclusive pursuits. Yeah, like you can be yeah, you're right. rational, and science minded and insist on evidence for you know your beliefs and be profoundly deeply spiritual. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Rain and I we were just we actually just were talking about this on a recent episode. You know the 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 foundation the foundation of uh let me put it this way the sort of the fundamental law of physics is the preservation of energy and matter. Mm. The belief that everything that exists today has always existed and will always exist as long as the universe exists. Man, Sufis have been saying that mm -hmm. for 1500 years. Yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, mm -hmm. you're right. The, the more we know about the universe, the more science advances, the more spiritual it starts to sound. Mm -hmm. You're absolutely mm -hmm. right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. All right, let's see what we got here. Let's see what you got. I'm gonna pick the dud. <laughs> <laughs> see that self-defeating attitude I know, right there? Right? What's up with that? Oh, well, I didn't pick a dud, but I picked what we just talked about. What is faith and how does it differ from religion? I mean, we kind of already yeah, we yeah, traversed that a little one, bit. Yeah. So let's, let's, let's go on to something else. <laughs> I 
can you be rational, science-minded, and still spiritual? We covered that. Okay, good. <laughs> well, we're, we're pretty good at yeah. this. You know, we could just ask the questions I and know. then splice in right. the answers. Let's see. How do you be a good person? <laughs> uh, we, a little, we touched we on touched, that a little bit a little too bit. with Mike Sure, but yeah, we'd we be happy to dig maybe, in. Maybe uh, elaborate a little bit on that and then we can move on quickly to another one. If there's more well, to say. What do you think, Rich? You know, How do you be a good person? I, I don't, you know, I, I, I can't say I have the ultimate answer to that. Mm -hmm. I think that there is wisdom in, in um, philosophical and spiritual um, strains of thought that have survived for thousands of years from which you can extract principles for how to orient your life. Um, fundamentally, I think that being a good person is intertwined with that search for purpose. And it always goes back to um, finding a way to devote that purpose in service to other people. I think fundamentally being good is really about service. Yeah, yeah. I heard this phrase the other the other day about um, being otherish. Someone was talking about it. Hmm. I forget who was saying that. Like we're, we're selfish and human beings are naturally selfish for a number of mm -hmm. reasons, I think, because children need to be selfish to survive. We need it as a species to be selfish to survive. I'm gonna feed myself this, you know, deer carcass and make sure that the people in my cave get the deer carcass. And then my children get the piece of the deer carcass. And there's a kind of a, a self, I sounded like Dwight Schrute just then, <laughs> but, there's a, but there's a selfishness in this. Uh -huh. But then as we grow mature and progress, then we can be otherish instead of selfish. And how do we be a good person? We just, when I find myself being good and I haven't always been good and I struggle with being good, it's not like I'm arrived by any stretch of the imagination, ask my wife. Um, but the idea of trying to be otherish instead of selfish hmm. um, helps me in that, in that path. I like that term otherish, I hadn't heard yeah, that before. I, I'm gonna steal that. Yeah, good. Yeah, You're welcome to it. All right, pick a new one. I think you're up. It's up to me now. Oh, yeah. Here we go. There's a, a lot of gabbing. What happens after we die? <laughs> um, this is one of our chief topics on yeah. metaphysical milkshake. I love this topic. With uh, Rob Bell, in fact. That was oh, is the, that the yeah, one that you explored with him? Two-parter mm -hmm. with Rob Bell. Yeah. yeah, I was obsessed with this idea. And we were asking Rob, like, because he's a Christian who famously kind of dis believed in hell for lack of a better way of, it's more mm -hmm. complicated than that, but that was, and so he got essentially excommunicated right. for those who don't, aren't familiar with his work, but he's still a Christian and very devout. Mm -hmm. So I was like, so you're going to meet Jesus. Like if you get hit by a bus, Rob Bell, what happens between you getting hit by that bus and you meeting Jesus? Like, I, like talk me through that it. took two like, hours. Very specifically, <laughs> Step by uh -huh. step, you're hit by a bus, <laughs> you'll meet Jesus. Like what? I think we I think we we covered maybe like a second of real time yeah. in two hours. We didn't uh -huh. even get anywhere close <laughs> to Jesus. We didn't get to Jesus. We never got there. That asshole. <laughs> uh, but um so what happens after we die? Um so I'm writing a book right now uh about spirituality, which is this is quite an endeavor. Rezo's done it before. It, it's really hard. Um, and the, I'm, ta I'm taking these, some of the biggest topics in the universe. Like um, I have a chapter on death uh -huh. and I have a chapter on God and I have a chapter on religion. Right. Um, Just one chapter on God. <laughs> it's, <a short> chapter. <laughs> it's, killing, I, it's killing me. I'm literally in that chapter right uh -huh. now. And it's, <laughs> I've, I've interviewed Reza about it. I'm, it's killing me, dude. It really is. But I'm, I'm coming up with some good stuff. Um, but uh, what happens after we die? I've I've talked about you know my belief as a Baha'i in the Baha'i faith we believe that there's an analogy that the body is it's not just the Baha'i faith. There's many spiritual traditions that the body is a cage, and that our reality is the bird within the cage. And mm -hmm. when the cage is broken, the bird goes free. And that's not something to be mourned the brokenness of the body or of the cage. It's to be celebrated the glorious journey of of the bird flying free of the material and physical limitations. But I will say that I, I recently had a friend uh, pass away and this has been a big year of death for me. My father passed away about a year ago. Um, the co-founder of our nonprofit in Haiti died of cancer. And then one of my dear friends died of cancer. Sorry to hear that. Um, thanks, uh, recently. And 
You know, it's such a tricky topic, but um, there are there are good ways to die and there's not so good ways to die. And, and in fact, one of our episodes, I'm sorry, I feel like I'm really plugging the hell out of this <laughs> podcast. Well, Sorry. we do ask a lot of these questions. Yeah. So, um, you know, but we had you a are def- here to do that anyway. A so little bit. Just lean we, into it. Okay. Brain. We had a death doula on the show um, and she was amazing. And that's it's like a birth it's doula. It's exactly what yeah. you think it is. Yeah. Uh, and it's, she helps you transition towards death. And that can be everything from like, where do you keep all your, Facebook passwords and, mm-hmm. you know, and also, um, you know, how do you want your ceremony to be? How do you want to pass? What, what do you your... want your deathbed to look like? Yeah, that was the big question. Yeah. What do you want your deathbed? So in having these discussions, we talk a lot about death and, you know, this friend of mine who passed away, like he didn't want to look at death. And I think probably because he was mostly atheist. I think that he was like a third, you know, um, wondering, but mostly. And so for him, his journey towards this inevitability of death, because he was given stage four stomach cancer, was like, I'm going to fight cancer tooth and nail with every power in my being, which is great, right? which is important. But 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 fueled by this terror. Of fueled death. by terror mm-hmm. and, a, and a kind of like, and I would talk, I would be always the voice to talk to him and say, David, can we, talk about this a little bit, or I would send him like a little writing about from the Dalai Lama or a Buddhist text or something about something about death and like, you know, I'd encourage him to get some therapy, help process the emotions around it. But we live in the Western culture in this abject terror of death. We don't talk about death. And friend, a friend of mine was telling me that in uh, now in contemporary society, like we, um, in, in the Victorians never talked about sex, but talked about death all the time in Victorian England. There were (laughs) death parties and there would be Uh corpse viewings and seances. And there was just this thing. And sex was like not talked about. Now we just talk about sex and everything is like reality (laughs) TV shows are just literally like, hey, who are these people are going to hook up? Pretty soon we're just going to have like... Mm shows where just like people meet and they hook up and we watch them having sex. <laughs> I like think it's, it's called porn. Is that, oh, that's porn. porn. Oh yeah. That's what porn is. I've never checked it out. I'm going to need to check that. I'll, I'll show you that some out. stuff. Is there any on the internet? No, <laughs> it's hard to find. But. Um, okay, thanks. Send me a link. Uh, but this uh, this idea that uh, we we are so afraid to talk about death yeah. and it is the one thing that we all have in common, everyone yeah. on this podcast yeah. and everyone listening to this podcast. And um if we embrace it as a continuation of the mystery, and yes, it's scary, um, we can have a very different relationship to death. Yeah. Yeah, I think it is less less about what happens when when we die. I mean, anybody who who, you know, answers that question with any level of certitude is somebody I'm probably not going to trust. <laughs> right. <laughs> mm-hmm. I was just gonna um, say that. But it is it is about appreciation of death and how to bring death into our daily experience so that we can appreciate the richness of life, Mm -hmm. you know? Mm -hmm. Because that is a a certitude and a certain duality, you know, that we need to understand. Our our culture is so whitewashed of any references to death whatsoever. And despite our, our, you know, our brains look intellectually. Mass, look at the mass denial happening in our country right now. It's unbelievable. 650,000 people yeah. dead in our country mm-hmm. in, a, in a year yeah. and four months. Yeah. And we're not talking about it. And they're partying like it's yeah. 1999. And there's no one is, is looking at it. And so half of the population is going, I'm sorry to say this, is going, you know, like what the fuck? Yeah, yeah. And uh, I know that gets- it's a, it's a, I think it is a reflection of this very thing, right? Because we're so afraid of death and we have so little, I mean, like, you know, we don't connect with it in any way. Like the minute somebody dies, they're removed from our line of sight and we don't have language for how to talk about it in a healthy way Mm -hmm. beyond kind of like the traditional structures around funerals, et cetera. Um, And I think intellectually, we all understand that we're gonna die, but I think deep down, we all think somehow we're gonna figure out an end run around (laughs) it for us personally. like. Um, and that creates that like low grade fear that we carry with us that forces us to even put it further out of our, our well, mind. I, I think the answer is ultra marathons. Yeah. Um, here's, here's what I would say. Yeah. I mean, obviously I have no idea what the hell happens mm-hmm. after we die, but 
to go back to kind of what I was saying earlier about the scientific fact that we are eternal, right? That the things that make me what I am, and I mean like the cells in my body, the atoms, you know, the, the, the sort of most base structure of what has created this body is eternal, is forever. Those things don't just go away. They are, they become something else, right? Matter and energy is forever. So that means my cells, my atoms, they are forever. They don't just stop being, they just stop being me. But I am more than just this physical body. Whether you believe in a soul or not, you believe in consciousness. A lot of you know philosophers, a lot of theologians will say, your consciousness is your soul. Stop thinking of them as different things. That your ability to say, I am me, is you recognizing and communing with what is your soul. So if your consciousness is a real thing, then your consciousness is also the result of- And let me just your, jump in. Let me just jump in. Uh, yes. Because I think it's important to understand that people, scientists don't know what consciousness is. No. Yeah. This is one of the great mysteries, no, no, no. right? right? And so, you exactly. can't talk about death without talking about consciousness. Exactly. And so defining you can't, what that yes, means. Yes, you can have brain scans and you can show kind of some vague areas in brains that light up when you look at a piece of a cherry rhubarb pie versus a, you know, a lion in the, in the jungle, but we don't no know idea. what it is. There's, exactly. there's, there's neurons and electrons and there's, there's cells and there's parts of the brain, but the idea of consciousness, loving, laughing, thinking, pondering, memories, the, the unification mm -hmm. of all of these different aspects of what it is to be alive and have this quote unquote internal experience. I just wanna say that Correct. And, for the record. Th and and what actually, aspect of that is individuated versus universal, collective. like this yeah. idea of panpsychism, that everything on some level is conscious, every accumulation right. of, of, of matter, and that there is, you know, like bees in a hive that we share some kind of, mm. you know, consciousness, like Godhead, mm -hmm. Mm. right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I actually believe that, but, but fine. If you don't believe that, you could still follow what I'm saying. And yes, Rain is absolutely right. Whatever consciousness is, and we don't know, is, involved in our biological processes, right? So I guess what I'm saying is when I die, all the things that make up my material self continue forever. That's science. The matter continues forever. The energy continues forever. Well, if my consciousness is in some ways the, the sum of my matter and my energy, then who's to say my consciousness doesn't continue forever in some way, shape or form? Do you know what I mean? So mm -hmm. when, when people ask me like, do you believe in life after death? That to me is life after death. That the thing that makes me me continues in some way that like my consciousness doesn't disappear because my consciousness is the result of matter and energy and matter and energy doesn't disappear. And that's very Sufi. Right. Mm, yeah. So the answer is, I don't know, but that's, that's my well, kind of prevailing yeah. theory. There's a, there's a great <laughs> metaphor in the Baha'i writings that I talk about in my chapter on death, which is, it's pretty simple. Uh, it's kind of like the bird in the cage one. It's, it's a little bit, it, you might go, that's kind of simple, but it's also profound. And that is that when we're a baby in the womb, we're growing what we need for this physical world. So we're in floating in, in this kind of stasis, growing our bones, our eyelashes, our, our ears and lips and eyebrows and elbows and everything that we're gonna need. And so the baby has no idea mm -hmm. why it's growing elbows. If you ask the baby, you interview the baby, What's up with the elbows, baby? Like, I have no idea. <laughs> I'm sitting in this amniotic sack. I'm fine. I'm connected with my mother. It's all, it's all good. Elbows, I don't need elbows. But then there's this very scary event of like going through the birth canal and like, oh shit, this whole, uh, this whole experience <laughs> is coming to an end. This is terrifying. <laughs> there's blood, there's pain, there's discomfort. But what an incredible mm. world we get born into. You get to kind of, you know, you get to see mm 
uh, you know, Picasso paintings and you get to have, you know, parties and you get to fall in love and there's all kinds of new experiences await you. Well, the same thing happens. So I don't know what happens when we die, but, but I think metaphorically speaking, we are like the death doula might say, we are being born into a new experience. And yeah. the, what we're growing in this world are not physical arms and legs. We're growing spiritual arms and legs and elbows. We're yeah. growing patience and kindness and humility and compassion and and love and honesty. And these, these qualities that are kind of quote unquote higher qualities, but qualities of light, those are what we take with us when we're, when we're plunged through that painful, difficult, bloody, difficult, painful mm -hmm. birth canal of death. Uh, into this other reality. I love that. There's also something beautiful about wonder and not knowing the answer that I think gives our lives a level of richness. Like if we could know everything, is that something that we should aspire to? Mm. And or is it even possible to know everything? Is mm. it possible to answer that question with certitude, what happens after death? And if we could answer it, should we? Mm. I don't Try know. Pass that bull. You know, I don't know. Good, good point. All right, let's see, let's see. Next up. Do we have to do all these questions? <laughs> no. We... <laughs> what is the nature of consciousness? We oh, already we did, just that. did that. Wow, we just did that. No, wow, crazy. we're ahead. It's crazy. Yeah. Head of the game. We're ahead on, I, well, time. Do we have a soul? What is it to you? I, <laughs> I kind of feel like. Consci you were talking about consciousness yeah. as a soul? I mean, that's. We I just did that. I mean, I think, I think the consciousness, yeah. soul, death thing, that's all That's all yeah. one of the same. All right, good, good. Maybe we will get to We're going to knock all these out. Look at that. Soul is just a word. It's just a word. And we, oh, what does it mean to be human? Ooh, mm, that's good. Damn, that's Do you have a, a chapter rich. on that one that's in your one. book? Not Rain yet. Wilson. <laughs> yeah. What does it mean to be human? Okay. Uh, Wait, there's, wait, here's, an, here's to, another one. Yeah, let's maybe we do Can both. I is be that... on your podcast? <laughs> rich, what? <laughs> Come on. Oh, no, go ahead, Rez. Um, human. Damn. Do you even know? I'm not I'm not sure. Yeah, I'm not sure. What is it about being human and how being human distinguishes us from the rest of the animal kingdom, the phyla out there that um that we have a sense of self-awareness, that we have this yearning towards spirituality that we have um, a level of consciousness that, that allows us to ponder the nature of consciousness itself. Is this just the evolution in brain capacity or is it something qualitatively Even pondering, different? Even pondering mortality. See, yeah. yeah, maybe part of, um, I once said that to my friend, I was like, you know, what's, he was basically, a, he's an atheist describing us as like, essentially like apes with bigger brains. I'm like, well, we're very different because we get to ponder our mortality and animals don't ponder their mortality. Mm -hmm. And he's like, oh, that's preposterous, but it's true. It is well, true. But I isn't, but let me just, that, what is I was that gonna- a, Is that a brain volume thing or is that something different altogether? I think it's different altogether. But I think one of the things that makes us human is that we get to have this bowl of questions and we get to have mm -hmm. this discussion about these questions. That's one thing, but go ahead. Well, so, but the problem with the the brain argument about what does it mean to be human, that our brains are just different, is that, well, then that means eventually, eventually we're going to be able to replicate that brain. Eventually we'll be able to put the same neural processes that make me um, think about my mortality into a robot. Mm -hmm. And so now the robot is thinking about its mortality. Is the robot human I'd now? I'd watch that movie. <laughs> and or, yeah, does, the, does the, that doesn't necessarily lead to consciousness. That's right. So. Or, um, you know, pondering, more, you know, death. Uh, I mean, we know that rhesus monkeys and elephants visit graves. They think about, you know, uh, their uh, fellow monkeys and fellow elephants that have died like uh, we a long time ago. We assume that's what they're doing because their behaviors seem to true, allude true, to that, I, but we yeah, don't know what sure, they're sure, sure, sure. thinking. Right. They yeah, could be are we anthropomorphizing it? Well, I mean, the there especially with elephants, there's no reason for them, you know, years later to revisit burial yeah. sites. And yet they do, they, we- They seem we, to be mourning and picking up bones. They seem to be mourning, and, yeah. Mm -hmm. So we see behavior. So that's all we can do is theorize based on their behavior, I guess. Um, 
But it's, but I, the reason that I was stumped by this question is that I'm wary of the brain argument. You know, I'm, mm-hmm. people ask, going back to what we had said before, oh, that spirituality resides in the brain. Uh, you know, it's, it's part of our cognitive processes. So it must be there for a reason. And you should probably think about that. The question then is, oh, okay, well then if I figure that out, it's bloop, 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 bloop. And then I do bloop, 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 bloop into a robot. Does the, will the robot believe in God? Yeah, mm-hmm. yes, it will. So what does that mean about what is unique about my brain? I just, I don't know. Mm-hmm. You know, when you were talking about panpsychism, I, and I said, yeah, that's me. That's what I, that's actually what I believe. I think that's what I mean is that it's hard for me to differentiate myself all that much from the rest of existence simply because my brain's a little bit different. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? Like mm-hmm. I, I accept that my brain is different and I rejoice in that, <laughs> but it's hard for me to feel too supreme about it, knowing that whatever you know my brain is could possibly be replicated. But I think, I think what you're getting at Reza is there is a kind of like a Western Christian philosophical supremism yeah. uh, that is really a little bit revolting, mm-hmm. which is kind of like, we are superior to the animals and <laughs> therefore we, we caretake the animals or we're, mm-hmm. we have dominion over the animals, we have dominion over the earth and we're uh, arrived and we have the Holy Spirit in us. And we're, there's this kind of like, and I'm doing that fakey voice accent because there is, that's and our- it filters into non-religious thinking as well. It's yeah, the same, the you know, you don't have to be religious to think that way. I, I think it, on top of that, there is the, the that hubris extends to this notion that we are capable of understanding everything. It's just a matter of, of refining our science and, you know, over time, figuring all of these things out. Yeah, in, and in I 57 think, years, we'll have consciousness well, no, completely we'll figured know every, out. Yeah, exactly. Like I just yeah. don't see that being possible. Like in the same way that, you know, a beetle is never gonna understand the human language. Like the brain capacity of that organism just, you know, prevents it from understanding certain things that were, that are obvious to us, right? Mm-hmm. So how much, and 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 so the, the hubris plays into this idea that we are supremely evolved, that there is nothing, uh, there is no truth that eludes our capacity to understand. And mm. I just think that's preposterous. Yeah, especially with our limited senses that we have. Yeah. We just have these five senses and, right. you know. And they're not, they're not all that good yeah. compared to the rest <laughs> of the animal yeah. kingdom. Yeah, yeah. You know? yeah. Um, all right, Rich. Yeah. Uh, there we go. All right, we have time for like one more of these. There we go, one more. Make it a good one. Going, I'm going hot pink. Are all religions fundamentally the same? We kind of covered yeah, that a little did. bit, we you know, the, from a Baha'i standpoint, but yeah. also Reza's standpoint. That we, I would just say, just be, um, and this is kind of a big deal over the last 30, 40 years in religious studies. Cause like, you know, a, a big part of the early 20th century of religious studies was all about, you know, religions are fundamentally all saying the exact same thing, but using different languages. And I agree with that. And then sometime around the 60s and the 70s, there was a backlash to that because people were saying, well, but you're not taking those differences seriously enough, right? That there's a reason why Christianity is different than Islam and Islam is different than Judaism and Judaism is different than Baha'i, et cetera, et cetera. And that we shouldn't wash away those differences by simply saying, well, they're all pretty much saying the same thing. They are all pretty much saying the same thing. That's actually true. But, you know, let's let's not um, devalue those yeah. differences is all I will mm-hmm. say. Yeah, well put. Sure. Let's I get with that. One or two more of these. Oh, I love this one. Are we addicted to everything? Boom. <laughs> That's a title of one of our episodes. I know. Well, you stole yes. that from, the, uh, from one of our episodes. I did. Dr. Gabor Mate. It hasn't Ooh. gone up yet, though. It has not no, gone up. I've had yet. Gabor on my Let show. Oh, you did. This is a subject, you know, that. Did that's he blow you away the way that heart. he blew me Unbelievable. away? Unbelievable. Because I was. Did he flip it on you? Oh, he flipped it on me. I'm so. like, oh, please he, flip it on me. He I am going to take Reza in a way. Yes. I was. He I broke was Reza so, down. Yeah. I was so I was in tears. 
You know, I mean, Rain has talked about he's had some addiction uh-huh. issues and he's, he hasn't, he's been very open about it. And, and I was like, listen, look, I'm, I'm not an addict. I never, I've never been addicted. To, I mean, sure, I take part in various vices, uh, but I'm not, a, I'm not addicted mm-hmm. to anything. And uh, Rain in the middle of the podcast, just kind of as a joke, was like, well, you're a workaholic. And I was like, well, you know, what, I mean, what does that even mean, a workaholic? And then Dr. Gabor Mate. Mm-hmm. <laughs> he's just a, a self-avowed you, you, yeah. yeah. you are You are the children of immigrants. Yeah. And your father and your meaning to your parents is so yeah. important. And you have come to America. And what you make of yourself is how you get your complete, your self-esteem. And it's your family. And it's how you I was just like break oh, your family down and shit. what they look to you. And you are nothing yeah. without your successes. Because I was like, I have six jobs. So what? That's awesome. That makes me great. Like, why <laughs> is that a bad thing? I work like, 16 it, hours a day. Like, and, you know, Gabor Mate's theory is that all addiction stems from trauma. And I was mm-hmm. like, what? Trauma? What trauma? This dude <laughs> just broke me down. And now I realize, oh, shit. I am a workaholic. Yeah. I have an addiction. That comes from some trauma. That comes from the trauma Your of- first of, generation yeah. uh, immigrant. Being a refugee, refugee, leaving everything behind, coming to America with like nothing and, you know, starting all In over In Oklahoma, again. right? Did you In feel the, the pull to defend your parents? Oh, totally. Yeah. Yeah, totally. I was like, and I was defending myself. And, well, it, and it was just, really profound in the, my discussion with him. I don't want to hear what he mm-hmm. said to you, Rich. I'll, I'll listen to that that podcast specifically. But I said, you know, me, I'm I'm like so poly addicted to kind of pretty much anything one can become addicted to. I joked, you know, I'm having my green tea here. I was like, it's like one addiction I allow myself. I don't even have like hard, I quit coffee because yeah. it was too hardcore. But but I said, the weird thing is that, and everyone in my family is addicted. My dad wasn't addicted to anything who passed away this last year. And he's like, and Gabor Mate was like, well, what did your father die from? And I was like, well, he died of heart disease. What kind of heart disease? Well, his uh, his arteries were completely clogged, and they tried to do a quadruple bypass, and they couldn't they couldn't get in. They, they had, he was just too clogged and backed up, and um, his aorta wasn't even working. It's like heart disease comes from trauma. That's a heart disease is its own kind of addiction. It's a yeah. trauma response. They've yeah. proven heart disease is a trauma response. Like holy shit, that really blew my mind. I think because my dad had this incredibly traumatic childhood, but he never did drugs. He never drank. He never fucked around. He never he didn't do any of that stuff. And I was like, what? What is? Why yeah. is he superhuman? And yet he died at seventy eight with his his entire chest just clogged with with trans fats. I guess. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And it's um, and that that really put a perspective. There's a kind of there's a heartbreak in that yeah. physical condition. Yeah. He has quite the gift of just lasering in on that thing, you know, that you're not even aware was such a big piece that what did he drove get on your you? behavior. Well, he, for me, it's like, my parents love me. They took care of all my needs. They love each other. They're still together. I can't, I'm, I'm in, I'm long time sober. I've been in recovery for a long time. And of course, um, you know, over the years, people, well, why do you think you're an alcoholic? Why? And it's, and one of the things you learn in 12 step is that's not really a fruitful uh, kind of thought experiment because it doesn't really provide you with the tools to live now. So you focus on the solution and your character defects, et cetera, and like working the steps. So I hadn't spent a lot of time trying to understand what might have led me down this path but I was certain that it had nothing to do with family history because I didn't grow up with any alcoholism in the family. I don't know anybody in my extended family that had it. I didn't suffer any trauma growing up that you would point to and say, poor Rich, he had to, not like typical kid stuff, bullying and the like, but nothing that I could point a finger at my parents and say, this, you know, my, my affliction is attributable in some part to this. But what he did was help me understand that and I'm very protective of my parents because they blame themselves and I'm constantly saying it's not your fault. Uh, but I did grow up in a very, uh, you know, uh, achievement, education oriented household where, you know, love, uh, you know, corresponded to how well you were doing in school or what you were achieving. Like my achievements were all this quest to, you know, seek approval and acceptance and, and love on some level, not in a really pernicious way, but 
definitely in a way that was real. And so he helped me understand that. And I was like, no, I don't wanna blame. Yeah. He's like, it's not about your parents being bad people. They're good people. They did their best or whatever, but just recognizing that truth, I think has been helpful to me. And yet at the same time, um, and I'm interested in what you guys think about this. Like, I feel that that Gabor is sort of a hammer in search of a nail. And I think addiction really is a little bit more complex than just saying, I think childhood trauma is a big piece in that, but I think it's reductive to say it's because of this. And if you heal this, you will no longer have your addiction problem. I don't think that it works no, I, that I way. I think I, I, I agree with that. And it is very complicated. And he had, and you know, I think, you know, we're, we're obviously simplifying I think what, yeah. what Gabor would say about stuff. But I do think that there is, like I would ask the question a little bit differently. Um, and I would, instead of, are we addicted to everything? My question would be, why are we addicted to things? Why do all of us find something that, you know, we have addictive behavior towards? And, and if his theory is that, because underneath it somewhere, somewhere underneath it, there's trauma. And well, I think he, even going further beneath that, there's a spirituality to all of it because addiction mm -hmm. is rooted in the search for answers or the search for comfort or making sense of the world or trying to understand you know, how you belong to this thing. Yeah. So he, I, one thing that he said that I thought was that I hadn't heard before, because we, you know, addiction is a disease, and addiction is this, and is this, and his argument was that addiction is the symptom to a problem. Sure. So maybe the problem isn't trauma. He, you, I think you're absolutely right that he will, he will always bring it back to trauma somehow. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and and Johan Hari will always bring it back to connection. Like I don't know if you read his book Lost Connection. Sure. Like that's yep. his vein, you know, or, or spiritual, in you know, disconnection, spiritual malady, um, mm -hmm. you know, whatever the case may be. But there is something to be said about thinking of addiction as a symptom. Now, what is it a symptom of? That's fine. You can. There's a different things to it. Um, and I think that was kind of eye opening to me, mm -hmm. to mm -hmm. find the thing that you feel like you can't live without and then ask why, mm -hmm. <laughs> right? right. Like we don't well, the drug or the behavior is the solution to the problem. It's not the problem. Right. Well, to pull the camera back a little bit, Until there's it stops 7 billion people on the planet. Um, are we addicted to anything, to everything? And the answer is yes. And I, I agree with Gabor Mahdi in, in this sense and the other author I'm not familiar with, you're talking about connection. I would agree with that as well. In, in terms of looking, if you're an alien looking down at humanity on this planet, you'll be like, yes, there's, there's a trauma and there's a trauma which is 10,000 years of wars and 10,000 years of starvation and 10,000 years of droughts and how difficult it is to survive. So we want stuff and comfort and we want, to, we want security. And so what is that? That means more stuff and more toys and more things and nicer things and softer beds and more choices in mattress foams mm. and <laughs> smartphones that can do everything for us. We'll never get lost again. We'll never experience the pain of being lost because we have ways on our phones. And never so it just- bored again. It never will be never be bored again. again because we have instant distraction with 147 games on our phones. And so humanity, 7 billion of us is- is a traumatized species on a planet, but we keep going to the wrong, just like an addict, mm -hmm. we keep going to the wrong well to soothe ourselves. We, instead of just like an addict, will go to the, to the mm -hmm. gin to soothe themselves because that worked for a couple years out of college. Mm -hmm. It worked quite effectively until it didn't work anymore. But humanity keeps going to the well of stuff. So it's status and stuff and safety and comfort instead of connection mm -hmm. and instead of, you know, this kind of inevitable spiritual transformation that will happen, whether a billion people need to die of climate change related catastrophe along the way for us to do it. But in some way, shape or form, we will evolve to a higher level of connectivity and, and not keep going to, to oil and materialism and consumerism to soothe this kind of mm -hmm. human wound. Mm -hmm. But short of a, revolution of consciousness, can we get there? Because I think it is true that we are addicted to everything. I used to think of addiction just in terms of like drugs, alcohol, gambling, sex, like the kind of typical laundry list. But 
really the more time I've spent in recovery, I am utterly convinced that we are all, that that addiction lives on this incredibly broad spectrum. Mm. And it can be your, you know, uh, capacity for just being in unhealthy relationships all the time, or always seeking out the wrong partner, all the way to our smartphones, of course. But it's all reinforced by this culture that is shoving down our throats this message that the 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 happiness w- that we seek and the kind of um, spiritual union, the yearning that we all share, can be sated through consumption and accumulation. Mm-hmm. And until we, you know, have a reformation of our social and cultural priorities, can that ever truly change, or do we just? delve deeper into this abyss. But that may be what climate change is giving us. Maybe, I hope, yeah. But I mean, it, it will be hor- horrific if, if the, you know, if the predictions, the scientific pr- predictions are correct and we go to, you know, three degrees, four degrees Celsius change, it will be incredibly mm-hmm. dire. And I don't want to undersell that, but it may force a kind of global reckoning about how we are in harmony with each other and in harmony with our planet and in harmony with materialism right. slash consumerism. It is it providing us with way. this opportunity. Yeah. You know, we, we joke a lot about how, oh man, what we really need is an alien invasion. If we only had an alien invasion- I wish we got an then we'd all invasion. Then we'd all unite together. We I have don't. an alien invasion. <laughs> the planet's on fire. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> you know, yeah. it's here. Uh, and well, we've, never been more, we've never yeah. been more divided and our, our facility for healthy, productive communication has been so eroded, it's insane. And I think if we were invaded by aliens, there would be you know half the population saying it was a hoax and the other population, you know. <laughs> That's right. Can we ever truly agree on a shared version of reality anymore? I don't know. We're running out of so. time here, but we can't end on this this like got, apocalyptic no, so, note. <laughs> I know that got so doom and gloom at the <laughs> know, end. Right? Oh my it goodness! The end so, of the world. Yeah. How, are what are we going to so do? We need, out a, there. we need a U-turn here. All right. Well, here's let's one go for back. You. Let's go, go back ahead. a page, and I will say that here. Give me those cards again. The, the ones you know. I think that um, these these questions: how to be a good person. Um, what how can we, human? oh, there's more over here. Yeah. yeah. Uh, what is the nature of consciousness? What does it mean to be human? You know, what it means to be human is to have these discussions about these questions, to question our lives, to try and be a better person, to, to ponder what happens after we die. And what do people misunderstand about spirituality? I mean, this is kind of the thesis of my book is that we need a spiritual revolution mm-hmm. to transform not only on an individual level, but on a societal level. And this is, and we can do it, you know? Mm-hmm. And I really believe, even just watching the Olympics, and I know it's corny and they, NBC is really good at like, she was up at 4 a.m. Yeah. every morning before anyone else got awake <laughs> and doing laps in the pool and her grandmother drove her and she <laughs> could only afford Cheetos to eat for breakfast. And now she's the fastest 200 meter butterfly swimmer in the world. And, and you get all invested. And mm-hmm. I'm just a sucker for it. But I love it. The teamwork, the camaraderie of these swimming teams, like holding each other and sobbing in each other's arms and how hard they've worked, the ingenuity, the strength, like I believe in us. I mean, this is ultimately what it comes down to is like, I believe in humanity. I really do. In the bottom of my heart, I believe that we have the ability to connect, to heal and to use tools from the various spiritual traditions to, uh, to, to elevate, and, um, you know, the world is in this rapid, uh, what is it, disintegration that's happening right now. And we, we've, we've talked about that climate change and, and the political, mm-hmm. you know, disunity. But we're also in a place of integration. And there have been tremendous strides forward. Look at the strides forward with, like, the conversations around race in this country. No, we have not healed racism. It's not over. Long way to go. But... It, we, we really are at a different place than we were yeah. two years ago. Yeah, we're reckoning with it in a way we weren't. Yeah, and the same with the, with the Me Too movement mm-hmm. and, and women in the workplace. And especially, I, we feel this in Hollywood, uh, and I'm sure it's in, in other businesses as well, but Hollywood was such a sexist and corrupt business. And now there's a reckoning there as well. So we, there are forces of integration. There are forces of, that are moving us forward. And, and I believe that, um, you know, 
that the the human beauty, ingenuity, fortitude, and determination we see in the Olympics can be uh, uh, put on to seven billion of us yeah. sharing this yeah. planet. And then I'll just say- You did it, you turned it around. Yeah, How about I'll, that? I'll, 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 I'll Go hand, ahead. The bat- hand the Olympic baton. Oh, oh, oh. <laughs> um, I, can't, I can't do this race because I smoked pot, so. Um, <laughs> Uh-oh, <laughs> yeah. and you eat donuts. And I eat donuts. Um, I think- that when you narrow your vision to our present moment, then it's impossible to be optimistic. It's impossible to think anything other than we are all screwed. Yeah, we're fucked. It's over. Try to broaden that view just for a minute. Just, Just open up your vision for a second. Look at this present moment as though it is an instant in a gigantic timeline. I think about the fact this is something you know one of our uh, guests, Malcolm Gladwell, uh, brought up. There was a battle in World War One, one battle in which one million people died wow. in one battle. Okay, mm. um, we're not. We are as far away from that experience today as you know, we are from mapping consciousness, right? Um, so broaden your viewpoint a little bit and it, it'll it, it, it infect you with a little bit more optimism. And then the only other thing well, that think I will about, say- and Let me add yeah. to that. Think about this American Civil War. Think yeah. about the fact that, what, what did people think about in 1867, yeah. you know, when- 150 years ago, that was not that long ago. And when, you know, 2 million people were dead on battlefields yeah. and blood soaked battlefields and the whole country was at each other's throats. People say, oh, it's never been as bad in the United States as really? it is now. It's like, <laughs> what no. about the civil war? Yeah. Yeah. What about yeah. millions and millions dead? And, and it, it probably seemed like there wasn't a, a way out yeah. Of that, so I just want to sure. support your then, thesis. This is the, the the only other thing that I will say is, it's also very easy to listen to all these incredibly loud voices, voices of radicalism and extremism, whether they be religious or political or or whatever the case may be, because those loud voices are what get the attention. They're mm-hmm. the ones that that come up on top. But always remember that any kind of fundamentalism, whether it's religious fundamentalism or political fundamentalism, ethnic, racial, whatever the case may be, is by definition a reactionary phenomenon. The voices of extremism that you hear are not independent phenomena. They are a reaction to what is independent phenomena. So when you hear someone screaming, you know, about, racism or political extremism or you know religious fanaticism understand that what that is is a reaction to progress and secularization and pluralism and you know a diversity, a, a, a diversity mm-hmm. that it's pluralism progress diversity you know those are the things that's the stream mm-hmm. what you are hearing is the response to the stream so so focus don't on the stream. Out. Yeah, don't freak yeah. out. <laughs> focus right, on right, the stream. Right, right. And no progress uh, occurs without that resistance or that friction, right? So the loud voices are the friction, but they're really, you know, the dying voices in the night as yeah, culture exactly. progresses. Don't confuse it. Yeah. Just because it's the loudest doesn't mean it's- Yeah, there were those the same majority. loud voices in the in the civil rights era sure. and the same loud voices defending our role mm-hmm. in, the, in the Vietnam War. You know, the, the, the same thing was happening then. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Put your head down in progress. Well, I feel like this was the everything bagel of metaphysical milkshakes. <laughs> <laughs> we my put it bagel, in the Vitamix <laughs> and I don't know how it's going to taste, but we did it. How do you feel? It was good. It was cool, right? This is what we do. This is yeah, what man. we live for. I dig man. it. I love it. Um, I love the show, Metaphysical Milkshake, available wherever you listen to find podcasts and you guys are easy to find on the internet. Other than that, any anything coming up or anything you wanna point people towards? More episodes. Are you doing this like in seasons or are you just gonna be putting them up? Like- We don't really know. You know? They're like, 
they just keep telling us. Yeah, like, they, they are like, we need more episodes. And uh-huh. like, okay, <laughs> all right. So who's they? <laughs> the, mis- the, the mysterious the podcast they. Gods. Yes, okay. yes, yes. Yeah. 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 No, I mean, look, we we enjoy it. Um, I think we 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 promised that we would do. I think maybe forty or forty five of them yeah. uh, a year, like which that. seems insane. Um, but you know, we'll just keep doing it as right. long as it's fun. I think the second it's not fun. Both of us will look at each other and yeah. be like, you know what? We'll throw in the towel. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. And they'll live on. The conversations will live on. But yeah, yeah it's it's a blast. I mean, I, I love having elevated conversations and what a treat to share this with with Reza. And and you're doing the same yeah. thing over here and a uh, yeah. big admirer of your Fun. podcast. And thanks for having us yeah. on. Yeah. Thanks, Thank you, you guys. Rich. And when those books are, are ripe and ready, come back and, we'll come back. and share with me about yep. them, please. Mm-hmm. Cool. All right. Peace. Plants. Namaste. Yay!